Hello and welcome to our review of episode 5 of Obi-Wan Kenobi. This video is sponsored by Coronavirus, which I've finally contracted. Do you want to sound like a more menacing villain than the Grand Inquisitor? Do you want to do an impression of Ben Shapiro after his balls have dropped? Do you want to have fever dreams that look like the Star Wars cantina scene as imagined by David Lynch? Well, I put it off for two years, but finally I was persuaded to try COVID, and let me tell you, it's everything they said it would be. And listeners to this podcast can get it at a discount rate by using our code PLATOONKOOF for 60% off the promised efficacy of the vaccine. Truly, you will not find a better offer on the internet, so use our code PLATOONKOOF today and make sure you share this video like the plague. Before we begin with episode 5, a word on the reaction to episode 4. Sensible people took umbrage with the scene where Kenobi smuggled Baby Lair through Fortress Inquisitorius under a comically oversized coat lifted from the Pink Panther, rightly arguing that this is incredibly dumb writing. But when they pointed out how incredibly dumb the writing was, they were met by a coordinated response from the Disnoids which ran roughly as... Star Wars has always been silly, you're just looking for an excuse to nitpick. And since this was quite a common refrain, and because that refrain is about as incredibly dumb as the writing being defended, I thought it would be worth taking a few minutes to address it, because it reveals that, once again, the people most passionately defending Disney Star Wars know the least about Star Wars. The fundamental point, the most important one to keep in mind, is that there is a difference between humour and plot, between joke and story. Star Wars has indeed always had a sense of humour, sometimes it's been sillier than other times. The difference is that that humour has, by and large, been separated from the plot, the narrative, the story, the construction of the film in which it has been placed. To take one of the examples I've seen cited most often, the stormtrooper bumping his head in A New Hope was accidental and entirely irrelevant to the plot of A New Hope. Like Jean's guy in The Mandalorian, it's a comical mistake that has become something of a meme or an easter egg. It works in juxtaposition with the intended seriousness of the scene in which it's placed. Remember that before we all agreed that stormtroopers were incompetent goons, they were set up in the original trilogy, going all the way up until Empire Strikes Back, as a serious threat and something to be feared. The first time we see them, they wipe out the rebels. Obi-Wan tells us they are accurate, skilled. He has to use the force to escape them. The entirety of our time on the Death Star is spent running from them. In Empire, they storm Echo Base. The Imperial Assault is a blitzkrieg. It's unrelenting and it's irresistible. Later, they take Bespin, and it requires courage, ingenuity, and luck to get around them. Even the prequels build toward this image. We're told the clone troopers, the precursor force, are much more competent and deadly than droids, something we see repeatedly. We're shown their skills, they are not the butt of jokes. They are the principal agents involved in the obliteration of the Jedi in Order 66. The few Jedi who escape Order 66 are known to be exceptionally skillful because it takes exceptional skill to survive their encounters with the clone troopers. Stormtroopers don't really become the butt of any joke until Return of the Jedi, when they are beaten by teddy bears with sticks and arrows, not coincidentally, the entire Ewok aspect of Return of the Jedi is probably the weakest of anything in the OT, and one of the reasons it's amongst my least favourite Star Wars films. But, even then, the Ewok's victory has a basic conception of stakes and payoff. It's supposed to convey that hope can be found in the most unlikely of places, that the efficiency and technological superiority of an occupying force can be bested by Plucky, committed underdogs with skill, ingenuity, and a superior knowledge of the environment. A clumsy attempt to convey a real-world phenomenon, and one that has payoff precisely because the stormtroopers and the Imperial forces generally have been built up to seem overwhelming. In that context, an accidental easter egg, the trooper banging his head in A New Hope, is funny. But it isn't integral to the Death Star sequence. It doesn't detract from the stakes of the scene. It is absolutely irrelevant to the plot. It adds levity, to be sure, but not to the detriment of the stakes in that or future films. Contrast that 
with the Pink Panther scene in Kenobi Episode 4. Here, what we have is not a joke, it's not a moment of levity that's irrelevant to scene and narrative construction, the plot of A New Hope works without the trooper banging his head, it's fundamentally irrelevant, but the Pink Panther scene is integral to the plot of Obi-Wan Kenobi. You absolutely cannot dispense with it, it is instrumental to what is supposed to be the logical progression of the story, the basic movement of people from beginning place A to plot goal destination B. It's not a throwaway line, it's not a character quirk, it's not a flip into side, not a scene designed to be funny but irrelevant. The show, as written, does not work without it. The fact then that it does not work with it is profoundly damning. Kenobi is anyway one of the most consciously humorless Star Wars entries and this episode in particular is bleak. We've had a child interrogated and almost tortured, we've seen the pickled corpses of dead Jedi giving Kenobi a mini bout of PTSD, we've seen drowned stormtroopers. The entry to the hangar is the setup for what is meant to be the climax of this especially bleak show, the height of seriousness, the thing to which all the preceding builds. I'm not convinced the writers were deliberately striving for comic effect here. There's no build up to it, the stakes of the scene are too high. There's no indication it was supposed to be funny. It's just deeply, and I fear inadvertently, silly. Attempting to defend this on the grounds that Star Wars used to tell jokes occasionally is to fundamentally misunderstand the difference between jokes and bad writing, conscious and unconscious silliness. It amounts to an attempt to excuse illogical bad writing and terrible scene construction by comparing it with something that is simply not comparable. This excuse making, this defense of utterly lazy writing, reveals a lot about why modern Star Wars is in the mire it's in. Defenders of Disney Star Wars are foot soldiers of one of the most culturally powerful corporate entities in the history of the world and the one in charge, much to our regret, of the entire Star Wars franchise. The fact so many people are so eager to roll over for Disney, and even to defend it for what is objectively bad writing, disincentivizes improvement. It's cheaper for the company and easier for the writers to appeal to the lowest common denominator, and Disney Star Wars fans have apparently never seen a denominator they aren't prepared to drag lower still. And so the quality of these shows continues to diminish, because the only feedback Disney and its writers pay any heed to comes from that faction of consumers with all the discriminative faculties of a cum-drunk prostitute. Just open your mouths and drink the content. This goes beyond Star Wars, this is common to modern film. A significant chunk of moviegoers know nothing about the construction of film or even of basic writing, but the difference between now and previously when the same condition held is that people these days are hostile to anyone who attempts to explain what makes good rat and what separates good rat from bad. This leads to a destruction of standards across the board that is not intended. Most people have the good taste to say Casablanca is better than Fast and Furious 13, but reflexively dismissing any analysis of qualitative difference in film as nitpicking for example signals to movie studios that qualitative difference in film actually doesn't matter all that much to the audience, which is one of the reasons there is only one Casablanca but about 15,000 Fast and Furious movies. An inadvertent failure to discriminate is bad enough, a conscious and deliberate attempt, as we've seen from Disney Star Wars fans, to reject any attempt at discrimination means they get what they deserve, while the rest of us have to put up with the standards that fall lower and lower and lower with every new installment into the franchise. I've spent time in previous videos and in our comment sections explaining why nitpicks are therefore incredibly important, and I'm happy to continue this where the objection raised by our audience is constructive and inquiring. For example, is this in fact a nitpick? Why does your objection matter to the plot? Is this really as bad as you say? Does it really break continuity? These are all legitimate and valid questions to ask because we can have a conversation about them, we can have a debate about them. I might be wrong, I might mistake the severity of an apparent break with continuity. Alternatively, you might be. But if you are constitutionally ignorant and dumb to aesthetics, and the construction of scenes, plot and narrative, and simply hostile to anyone who thinks there is a difference between good and bad writing that needs to be interrogated if we are to raise the standard of the rat we consume, well, 
frankly, at this point, you can get fucked because you are the parasitic chlamydia that's making Star Wars sick. Standards are a good thing. Art can be judged objectively. There is such a thing as good writing as distinct from such a thing as objectively bad writing. It is important we remember this distinction. It is important we interrogate this distinction. It is important we highlight this distinction wherever it occurs in order that we actually aspire to create something better than what we are getting at the moment. Now, on to episode 5. That preamble frees us of the need to do an extensive recap of the previous episode, where the writers stole equally from the plots of Fallen Order and The New Hope to spare themselves the task of actually creating something new. Obi-Wan and Ilaria Sand infiltrated Fortress Inquisitorius, they rescued Baby Leia, they escaped on improbable snowspeeders, but Space Moses placed a tracker in Baby Leia's Volkswagen droid, which enabled it to lie about its carbon emissions while also letting Space Moses and Darth Vader follow Kenobi, Ilaria Sand, and Baby Leia to wherever it is they are going next. It's going to be hard for Episode 5 to be worse than Episode 4, but then again, I thought it would be hard for Episode 4 to be worse than Episode 3, and so all bets are off. How will I know if this episode is better or worse than the preceding one? Well, by applying exactly the same nitpicky standard I've applied to the last four episodes and judging the show's objective qualities as rigorously as is allowed for while suffering from the Rona. We open with a brief shot of what quite a lot of people hoped this show would have done a lot more of by now, a flashback to Obi-Wan and Anakin training together. If this show has been good at anything, it's been the prequel callbacks, and it's not been all that good at them even, given they tend to put this new offering in a relatively unflattering light. An unflattering light is not the only thing that explains why these scenes do not quite work, for the de-aging program they've attempted to run on Hayden Christensen has not worked particularly well. At times he looks somewhat like the vaguely pretty version of Anakin we remember from episode 2, or the implied intervening period between episodes 2 and 3 of the prequels, but for the most part, Anakin here looks like he's aged between 15 and 25 years, depending on which camera angle is being used. It is not especially flattering. However, by contrast, and to give the show some praise, episode 5 of Obi-Wan Kenobi does not repeat the mistakes of earlier episodes by showing us too much of Kenobi and Skywalker sparring. This was a significant cock-up in episode 3, because having so recently seen snippets of the final duel from Revenge of the Sith, the slow, clumsy, drunk wielding a baseball bat offering we got from Kenobi in episode 3 was a stark and unwelcome contrast. Instead, we quickly cut away to the bridge of one of those Star Destroyers they didn't have orbiting Fortress Inquisitorius for some reason, despite it being one of the most important Imperial facilities in the galaxy, where Vader praises Space Moses, again, for her tracker plan that the writers filched from A New Hope. In the last episode, Vader immediately flipped from you have failed me to you're brilliant, despite having no good reason to do so as far as Space Moses is concerned. Space Moses has let Obi-Wan escape on at least two occasions already. In episode 2, where she incompetently let him escape in order to stab the Grand Inquisitor for daring to warn her about incompetently letting him escape, and then, more damningly, on Fortress Inquisitorius, meaning Vader is in fact quite a tolerant guy when he isn't snapping the necks of random civilians for fun. Space Moses's sterling record of capricious violence and questionable competence sees Vader confer upon her the title of Grand Inquisitor and they set course for Jabin, the hub of the Jedi smuggling operation referred to in episodes 3 and 4. Here we're reunited with the con artist from episode 2. It's explained that Kenobi and Baby Leia cannot get back to Alderaan yet, because there are an awful lot of people waiting to get off world and they've been waiting here for several months and it would be awfully unfair to make them wait yet again to smuggle more important passages off first. Which poses a question. Why then have Kenobi and Baby Leia come here? We've already seen in episode 2 that it is relatively easy to hop on random cargo freighters and go from place to place. We've also seen that the Imperials have a tenuous grasp on many of the worlds in this part of the galaxy. Obi-Wan has already got on a standard passenger freighter to get off of Tatooine, and there is no shortage of ships in the Star Wars galaxy. Rather than following this predetermined route to a central hub, 
Would it not have been altogether quicker and safer to get dropped off at a random planet and found passage to Alderaan from there? Does nobody involved in the smuggling operation have a two-person fighter or any other kind of ship with a hyperdrive that they could have borrowed? One of the explanations for Vader being lenient with Space Moses, incidentally, was that her incompetence in letting Kenobi escape could be excused because she at least uncovered this Jedi smuggling operation. Bigger fish to fry. But, back on the Star Destroyer as it's approaching Jabin, Space Moses tries to argue against Darth Vader's plans to lock down the facility because, she reasons, this could result in the defenders holding up for days. But then Vader responds, it's not them we need to break. In other words, he is solely focused on Obi-Wan. It reveals that his principal, sole driving motive is not the destruction of the smuggling route or the capture of more Jedi, which is the only thing that could forgive him for giving Space Moses in previous episodes, but rather his sole driving objective is his pursuit of Obi-Wan. And so there is no reason for him to have been so forgiving with Space Moses for letting Kenobi escape multiple times. Back on Jabin, the Volkswagen droid, now with its new evil red eyes, does nefarious things without anybody spotting it, while Kenobi takes a look at yet another wall full of inscriptions left by previously smuggled Jedi. Because what you really want to do with your top secret smuggling operation is to graffiti Quinlan was here 2022 on the walls of random sheds all across the galaxy, thereby giving your location and your smuggling route away to any Imperial Stormtrooper who just so happened to raid the facility. We also see a box full of discarded lightsabers that would have given General Grievous a robotic orgasm. The tracker Space Moses slipped into the Volkswagen droid is, in fact, much more than a tracker, but it's not clear exactly what it is. Is Space Moses controlling it from afar, or is it a generic do-evil-stuff-when-the-plot-requires-it device? In either case, how does it work? It's one thing to slap a tracking beacon on a ship, it's another thing to insert something into a droid at a moment's notice that overrides its entire nature, purpose, and personality, either allowing it to be controlled remotely, which is the only explanation that makes any kind of logical sense, or else just to do mean shit occasionally. This is an example of a plot device straining credulity because it's too convenient. It is, in fact, a contrivance. The equivalent would be Obi-Wan throwing a tracker onto Slave 1 in Attack of the Clones that allows him to take control of Slave 1 and fly it into an asteroid or turn its guns on Django. Here we see the droid, either remotely controlled or just being mindlessly but conveniently evil, wake up of its own accord and go exactly where it needs to go to do exactly what our heroes don't want it to do, eliminating the base controls and shutting the hangar doors in time for the Star Destroyer to arrive. None of this actually needs to happen, by the way, which makes it an especially irritating contrivance. When the Empire arrives in orbit over Hoth, they don't need agents inside Echo Base to establish the threat by locking the rebels inside. Jabin is substantially less well-equipped than Echo Base. If your goal is essentially to lock the smugglers in the base and keep them there until their spirit breaks, you could and the writers could, have accomplished this with the mere presence of the Star Destroyer in orbit, perhaps with a quick shot of it swatting a couple of ramshackle fighters out of the sky, or an orbital bombardment of the type we know Star Destroyers are capable of. We get more flashbacks to Anakin and Obi-Wan training, the purpose of which is to show that Anakin is impatient, a character flaw that's present in Vader 2, substantiating Kenobi's line about Vader lacking the patience for a siege. Vader commands that the attack be launched, and the Star Destroyer sends out a massive, overwhelming force of… two shuttles. Kenobi gives a speech laying out the Defender's battle plan, and it isn't actually a battle plan. Despite there being an awful lot of people in this facility, many of whom are armed, and despite them having quite a few spare lightsabers lying around as previously established, he says the goal is not to fight off the Empire but to hold them off by closing all the doors, thereby locking themselves in voluntarily rather than scampering off through all the entrances he's just acknowledged exist and disappearing into whatever passes for the wilderness on this planet on the theory that so many people running in so many different directions would be untrackable by the Empire. This base has no shield generator. Star Destroyers, as mentioned, are known to be able to bomb things from orbit and they have complements of TIE bombers aboard. The only reason Echo Base survives more than a few seconds in Empire Strikes Back is because it has a shield generator. 
Now I'm sure this can be explained away by Vader's want to tackle Obi-Wan personally, but it still relies on stupidity on Vader's part to make the plot happen. The smugglers are voluntarily bunching into one unshielded base. I say we take off and nuke the entire site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Granted, you couldn't have given this base a shield generator because the Volkswagen droid could inexplicably have found a way to deactivate it. Such a shame the Empire didn't think to do that in Empire Strikes Back, it's such an easy thing to do. But it would have taken precisely one line of dialogue to fix this problem in this episode, just have someone explain that the base is too deep underground to be bombarded, so they'll be safe for a while. That's quick, easy, efficient, it takes next to no time to establish, it embellishes the scene with useful information, and it adds to the sense of claustrophobia and confinement entailed by the defense of this base. Incredibly easy to do, would have added substantial value to the show, but nah, can't be bothered, moving on. I am trying quite hard to find things to like about this episode. The prequel callbacks as a means to establish or to re-establish character in a way that explains their present actions is not a bad device, to be sure. The siege setup for this episode is playing on a familiar theme, albeit with a needlessly incompetent setup, but throughout this show, I've been expecting to have much good to say about the look, the feel, and the aesthetic of the production. And yet we're now in the penultimate episode, and it remains one of the drabbest, most visually indistinct of all Star Wars offerings. Each episode reportedly has a budget of around $25 million. And yet, even the fundamentals of Star Wars, like ship designs and aesthetic, look cheap. We had it with the snowspeeders in the last episode. It's here again with the Star Destroyer and the two landing craft. Would it really not have been cheaper and yet much more visually appealing to use the old models they presumably still have in storage? I'd wager it cost more to CGI this Star Destroyer than it would have done to use the model and superimpose the backdrop as they used to do. And yet the result is so much less characterful than the original they are trying to replicate. I think Industrial Light and Magic are working on the effects for this show, but the result looks like it's been done by interns at the company. An implausibly large number of stormtroopers turned out to have been carried on the two landing craft, and they wait around for Space Moses to arrive with her usual irritating not-quite theme music so she can shout at them a bit and tell them to shoot at the main door to the base because stormtroopers cannot perform basic operations without somebody strutting around and yelling at them. Inside, the proto-rebels are still struggling to get the hangar doors open. It turns out they need somebody small to crawl into the vents and fiddle with the mechanisms. So, naturally, Baby Lair comes to the rescue and goes crawling around in the vents where she begins tinkering with the electronics without instruction because Baby Lair can just do that now and no droid was around that could do the same job more efficiently and plausibly. Astute psychologist, able to resist the force powers of Inquisitors, consistently more competent than any character she's in the same room as. Well, Disney Star Wars can't venerate women without turning them into laughably unsubtle Mary Sues, and the same applies to Baby Leia, but I can't help but notice that much like her relationship with Obi-Wan, Leia will have to forget all these skills come the original trilogy, where she's not much use in mending the Falcon, and where these door-opening skills she's here demonstrating might have been very useful indeed in one scene in particular. Kenobi gets a message from Bail Organa which causes all manner of fucking issues again. Bail Organa explains that if Vader has found Kenobi and learned of Luke and Leia, he will need to go to Tatooine to whisk Luke away and save the dream. And indeed, canonically, Bail Organa is supposed to have known for some time that Anakin is Vader and Vader is alive. Likewise, Bail Organa knows that Ahsoka Tano is alive, and yet, as per episode 2, with the ludicrous chase sequence between Obi-Wan and Space Moses, it's established that Bail Organa never bothered to tell Obi-Wan any of this incredibly consequential information. Why the hell not? Would this not be the most important thing to tell Obi-Wan? That his former apprentice, Darth Vader, who he knows is Anakin Skywalker, no matter what the writers of this show seem to think, is still alive? and thereby there is still the greatest possible threat to the children Obi-Wan is supposed to be guarding, why the hell would Bail Organa have withheld this information? Anyway, we then get some of Ilaria San's backstory and the reason she hates the Inquisitors, which I guess isn't terrible. The Imperials are about to break through the main door to the base, so Kenobi decides to buy time by speaking to Space Moses. He asks someone to 
tell the Inquisitor I want to talk, which you would think implies that the Rebels will send out some kind of radio communication to the Imperials outside to set up some kind of conference. But nobody tells the Inquisitor anything. Nobody radios anyone. Obi-Wan has just told someone to do something they do not do because they don't need to, because Obi-Wan just walks toward the door and Space Moses senses him and he senses her. She walks toward the door and then they have a chat rendering that a completely pointless line. What are you doing, show? Can only be reasons that Space Moses knew Vader was Anakin because she must have been a youngling at the time of Order 66 and on Coruscant, moreover. And he's correct. His accurate deduction gives her a mini PTSD flashback to Anakin approaching through a corridor and slicing through children, and Space Moses explains that she survived Anakin by playing dead and hiding among the bodies of the only family I knew. Kenobi suggests, therefore, that she is not serving Vader, she is hunting him, and yes, it turns out this is indeed what she's doing and what she wants. She wants him dead. Now, there's a slight problem in the setup here because, well, actually, there's a major problem in the setup. One major problem and one slight problem. The slight problem is that the Jedi can sense the Force abilities of people when they are living and when they are dead. There is no reason for Vader not to have realized that a person playing dead was, in fact, still alive. For the rest, the idea as a plot device is pretty good. It adds significant emotional weight to Space Moses' arc. Finally, in the penultimate episode, we actually have some character depth to one of the most important characters in this show, if not the most important character. But unfortunately, and going back to the significant problem I previously mentioned, the issue here is in the delivery, and the delivery is significantly flawed. We have seen Space Moses gleefully going along with the Empire generally and the Inquisitors in particular in prior episodes and by implication for years before. Her reason for hating Vader is that he killed her fellow younglings, so she has spent however many years going around hunting more younglings to subject them to the same fate. Now yes, the argument will probably be, well, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate the path to the dark side, that is, the fact she saw Jedi murder did not increase her love for the Jedi because they failed her, indeed she blames Obi-Wan for not being there to stop Vader. Rather, it makes her give in to the dark side of the Force. But giving in to the dark side is not an excuse for such a profound contradiction between reason, motive, and action. We have a point of comparison here. Ilaria Sand has been serving within the Empire to undermine the Empire. She does not go around taking delight in murdering innocent civilians because she hates an empire that murders innocent civilians. Her character is comparatively well written. The show establishes that she's a spy, portrays ambiguity in her role as an imperial officer. And ambiguity is the key to these characters. You could have kept this premise for Space Moses. Again, this could have been a really interesting twist. It's one of the smartest moves made by the writers so far, and it would have been smart even with a bar set much higher than it has in fact been throughout this show. But you would actually have to portray subtle ambiguity in her actions leading up to this moment for it to be believable. Instead, we see her being more ruthless in her hunt for the Jedi than even the Grand Inquisitor was. She serves in a base where pickled younglings are on display as trophies. Her job is going around capturing and killing younglings in order that they be pickled for decoration in Fortress Inquisitorius. Motive and action just don't add up here because the setup has been incompetent. Her motive for hating Vader because he killed younglings cannot lead her to kill younglings to get at Vader. It makes no sense. Now, I'm not arguing for anything overt by contrast. I'm not saying we should know from the start what her reasoning is, that she is a traitor, that she is a mole in the Empire. I don't want her motives telegraphed. I'm not saying the writers should be holding our hands. Rather, I'm saying they need to introduce, they needed to have introduced, nuance to her depiction before this point. A little bit of subtle foreshadowing, posing questions of the audience that are then answered by this revelation, have us guessing about her motive. Instead, what we've had is a setup that entirely contradicts this revelation. It's not a failure of this episode or this moment, it's a failure of everything leading up to this episode and this moment. Again, going back to the point I made in previous videos about why nitpicks are important, minor problems in earlier episodes compound themselves when you are writing a continuous story. 
Then we get more of this show's bog-standard mechanical incompetence. A. Space Moses has just revealed all this about herself, the fact that she is a traitor, quite loudly in front of massed legions of stormtroopers who just, I guess, weren't listening or didn't notice. B. They have just spent however long slowly pummeling the door with a big gun, but because it's now time for the plot to develop, Space Moses remembers she can cut through a door with her lightsaber as though it were made of jello leading us to wonder, why the fuck didn't she do that to begin with? It's not exactly as though lightsabers have ever been used to cut through blast doors before. Space Moses pushes the door open, Kenobi pushes her back. It looks very dodgy. And then stormtroopers slowly march into the building and manage to miss every single target inside despite most of them standing out in the open, in no cover whatever. Slender credit where it's due though, this scene kind of looks vaguely Star Warsy even if the plot armor is so thick that practically none of the goodies take a hit in the entire assault. Finally though, Ilaria Sand and the Loader Droid are taken out, which would have been more impactful had other people been taken out first. You build up the sense of loss to culminate in the tragedy of losing important characters, rather than straining credulity until you want to shock the audience awake. The Loader Droid sacrifices itself and dies on top of Ilaria Sand, and here, the composer actually decides to try something vaguely resembling emotional music, proving that she is capable of it, just very, very rarely chooses to deploy it. Ilaria San shoots a door panel to seal off Kenobi because door panels in the Star Wars universe work if you shoot them 100% of the time, and then she sacrifices herself with a thermal detonator. And because I am trying to praise this series where I can, I will say that this sequence is far from terrible. It's played well. It does master a sense of tragedy. It does leave you feeling something about the characters involved. It plays effectively on two types of grief. That we feel for powerless animals subjected to cruelty, in the case of the loaded droid, and the noble sacrifice of a principal character laying down her life for her friends. Greater joy hath no man than this, as the old poet said. Not coincidentally, Ilaria Sand has been the most well-written character since her introduction, and Indira Verma is probably the most competent performer in this season, so there is substantial payoff in this scene. We then have more prequel flashbacks to parallel what happens next. Obi-Wan hands over his lightsaber to con artist and gives himself up to the stormtroopers, explaining that there are other ways to fight. And again, giving as much credit as I can, the use of parallels here remains several dozen steps above the rest of the writing in this show, this is member berries with a purpose, by contrast with just throwing vaguely memorable things on screen in the hopes that the audience will be satisfied with a faint resemblance, a mere mimic, a simulacrum of a thing they used to know. Baby Leia, meanwhile, is still in the vent, using skills I am sure have not been established at all, as she tinkers with wires and such in her continuing bid to save everyone's lives because, well, she's Baby Leia and therefore she is incredible at absolutely everything whenever the plot requires her to be. Kenobi, having been captured, tells Space Moses, you're not bringing him to me, I'm bringing him to you, as regards Vader's imminent arrival, which, again, isn't abysmal rising. Somebody has actually put some thought into the scene construction in this episode, proving they don't have to rely on complete nonsense 100% of the time, it's just that they've let themselves get away with it for 98% of the time. He appeals to her on the grounds that there are families and children in the base, Therefore, presumably, given what he knows of her backstory, she will want to save them. And he asks her if she's going to let Vader do again what he did to her and her family and friends. Which is, once again, entirely undermined by the fact that she herself has happily gone around doing, herself, what Vader did to her. This makes no sense. This could have been great. It is wrecked by the bad writing of previous episodes. Kenobi says Vader won't sense her betrayal, because... All he will see is Kenobi, again reaffirming Vader's single-mindedness in his pursuit of Obi-Wan and so, again, undermined by Vader's past lenience with Space Moses for letting Kenobi escape so many times, apparently on the grounds, that it led to the uncovering of a wider smuggling network we now know he doesn't give a fuck about. Vader arrives and Space Moses tells him she has Kenobi secured inside, which is a half-truth because Kenobi is indeed inside, but he is most definitely not secured. Meanwhile, Volkswagen droid ineffectually tries to stop Baby Lair getting the hangar doors open, but she instantly realizes what's wrong and removes the mind control chip and it helps her complete her mission 
and open the hangar doors. Also, I can't help but recall that the Volkswagen droid has buzz saws built into its body and all manner of potentially nasty tools that could have done a lot of damage to a 10 year old child, but for reasons of convenience it just chooses not to use any of them and flaps around buzzing like a blue bottle in your bedroom that you really want to swat instead. Elsewhere, Kenobi makes it back to the ship and everyone begins to board, but con artist drops the fucking communicator used to communicate with Bail Organa that Kenobi gave him earlier along with his lightsaber because nothing happens in this show except by mammoth stupidity. This one scene is so indicative of the principal writing faults on display throughout this series and indeed all of Disney Star Wars. You need the plot to happen, just make someone do a dumb fuck stupid thing like dropping an important MacGuffin or forgetting important information or doing some other stupid thing as an excuse for the next episode to come about. It's so incredibly lazy. This episode is just taking the biscuit. Other episodes have been worse more often, but this scene encapsulates the worst of all of it. The only reason the next episode will happen is because he was a dick and dropped an important MacGuffin. That is it. How monumentally lazy you have to be as a writer on this show. These people shouldn't be being paid for this job. They are not putting in the effort to earn a wage. And then, and then fucking then some brain numbing stupidity. We've already seen how in episode four that the writers are prepared to steal wholesale from other Star Wars entries. That episode was best understood as a New Hope tribute with Fallen Order flavors. And hey, I guess at least the source material was good. Know what source material isn't good? The sequel trilogy. Know what's arguably the worst of that disease-ridden sludge, mechanically speaking? The Rise of Skywalker. Guess which film they're stealing from today? Yep, you're right. The Rise of fucking Skywalker. Vader marches into the hangar as a ship tries to take off, and he drags it back down with the Force. Look familiar? It stalls and lands and he starts tearing chunks out of it, only for another ship behind it to take off instead. Sound familiar? Well, that might be because it's the exact same device as the Rise of Skywalker used to explain the death and rebirth of fucking Chewbacca. In other words, one of the laziest, most contrived devices in modern cinema. Jesus fucking Christ on a Cartier dildo. Apparently, Vader's single-minded, force-attuned obsession with Obi-Wan blinded him to the fact there was another ship parked right behind the one he was attacking and he didn't notice it even when the first one was airborne. Moreover, when he did notice it, he didn't think to use the same force power he'd just brought the other one down with because, well, why? It worked one time, could he not have done it again? Puts one in mind of the scene in episode 3, where he doesn't use the force to put out a fire, he'd used the force to put out two minutes previously and just lets Obi-Wan escape, which cannot be explained by his desire for a challenge, as some people tried to explain it away as, because this episode has just proven he is single-mindedly obsessed with capturing Obi-Wan. Jesus fucking Christ show, and Jesus fucking Christ the people who tried to defend this garbage. The same single-minded, force-attuned obsession he has with Obi-Wan didn't, however, blind him to Space Moses' imminent betrayal because when she appears behind him and takes a swing, he senses it and he stops her. That was never going to work anyway. For their plan to actually have a chance of success, Obi-Wan would have had to be there to distract Vader, and Space Moses ought to have known that. Likewise, Obi-Wan. You could actually write a scene in this way that sees the plan succeed and Space Moses manage to stab Vader in the back. You could write a plausible scenario, easily, where that happens. We know that it can't happen because of what happens next, but that only emphasizes the problem. The audience knows it can't happen, but nobody in-universe knows that. If there is an eminently plausible way for such a thing to happen, and the only reason it didn't happen, Space Moses killing Vader, is stupidity on the part of the characters involved, that is essentially a form of post hoc ergo propter hoc reasoning. This happened, ergo this happens. The writers have managed to rely on a logical fallacy as an excuse to keep the story alive and not completely preclude subsequent established events, rather than decent writing and scene construction, which you could have done, but it would have required a bit more work and courage 
and ingenuity and thought, none of which these writers are possessed with. Space Moses and Vader then have a scrap, and the first half of this fight scene between them looks utterly abysmal. Star Wars fights have a known aesthetic. There are qualities to them that make them definitively Star Wars, and these writers and this director have not got a clue what they are. We get more of this show's trademark and very silly shaky cam, as Space Moses swings wildly at Vader with her saber, while Vader himself doesn't even bother to draw his, he just does comical sidesteps and nudges her around with the force for no very good reason, in a way that doesn't comport with any of the technique he demonstrates either before or since this fight, nor indeed does it comport with any other fight between Jedi or force-sensitive characters in the entirety of Star Wars, for the simple reason that it looks fucking dumb. Eventually, he snatches her double-bladed lightsaber from her, he snaps it in half and gives one half back, and then they have a short interlude of awfully choreographed fight, during which Vader literally just kicks her in the shin, again, technique, consistency, non-existent, before he takes her half of the saber away from her again and bears down on her as she has flashbacks to Order 66. I have to point out that video games do this so much better. Video games have to account for the mechanics of fights between four sensitive characters. If it is established that one four sensitive character can do anything with the force to another character who is force sensitive, then effectively the stakes in fight scenes disappear. If you can just steal the weapon of another Jedi, if you can just force choke another Jedi and they can't do anything with the force to stop you, well then there's no fight to have, is there? But virtually every old Star Wars game worth its salt understands this problem and so it has mechanics in place to fix it. If you try and force choke a character in, say, Jedi Outcast, he will force push you away so you can't do it. In no instance can you force pull the lightsaber away from a Jedi in the way that you can force pull a blaster rifle away from a stormtrooper because the Jedi are attuned with the force. These necessary rules and balances are in place in order for fights to happen. If you break these rules, no fight between force sensitive characters works. They are flawed from the off. The rules are not in place. They are innately unbelievable. Every event happens purely because the writers wish it to at any given moment not with reference to any established law in the universe. They are, by definition, contrived. And then, Vader stabs Space Moses. He explains, as she lies on the floor, not dying, that he saw her ruse from the beginning. He even calls her Youngling, meaning he knows that she was one of those Jedi in the temple during Order 66, which invites two questions. A. How did he not realize at the time that she was only pretending to be dead? B. What the hell was the point of putting her in charge of the search for Kenobi? To make this all deliberately as convoluted as possible? Let's just remember, Vader's goal is to root out and find and capture and kill Kenobi. Of all the ways you could possibly do that, taking a former Jedi Padawan, putting her in the Inquisitors, making her rise through the ranks, despite being put upon by her superiors. Having her subordinate to her superiors in the search for generic, random, any Jedi at all, which she happens to come upon Obi-Wan. Having her chase Obi-Wan but let him go several times in search for a smuggling route Vader doesn't care about. Promoting her to Grand Inquisitor, only to then be betrayed by her while he knows the betrayal is already going to happen, even though they've just let Kenobi escape again. Can you think of a more convoluted plan less likely to succeed than this one? What is the point of all of this? Why has Vader done any of it? Anyway, and then, who should appear behind Vader in this scene but the Grand Inquisitor himself? He lives. And so she will too, presumably, because it's now well established that being stabbed through the gut, which pretty well entails being stabbed through the spine as well, doesn't constitute a lethal wound in Star Wars. Therefore, the Force Ghost of Qui-Gon Jinn, if he ever shows up in this show, must be incredibly pissed off because why the hell did he die from such a non-lethal wound? The Grand Inquisitor says, and, well, he's back, so at least it's an excuse to mock his comically overdone stupid villain voice. He says, Her range was useful, but now it's not. Leaving the audience scratching their heads in such of a moment where her range was in fact useful. Shawadi wadi. And then, rather than finishing her off, he and Vader just walk away because 
There's a whole episode left and this is the Space Moses show after all and we can't have it end quite yet, can we? Space Moses, struggling on the floor, grabs her lightsaber which has magically been put back together and spots the discarded communicator dropped earlier by the con artist. She hears a fragment of a message sent by Organa which just happens to contain exactly the words, the few scantly remembered words that are not broken, that she needs to know where to head next. Tatooine. Once her massive internal hemorrhaging has magically fixed itself, this somehow is sensed by Kenobi on the fleeing transport, the hyperdrive of which has just failed, with the Star Destroyer said to be not far behind, which sets up, I dread, a callback to The Last Jedi and the interminably long and dumbass chase sequence that film forced us to endure. Though in this scene, I am again forced to wonder why the Star Destroyer, with its full complement of TIE Fighters, did not attempt to intercept the transport when it broke through the atmosphere. That's something that can only be explained by the writer's need for convenience. Speaking of Tatooine, this episode closes there with a sleeping baby Luke, meaning we're all off to have our climactic final episode in the place with the greatest potential to fuck up the beginning of A New Hope. I recall to your mind, dear viewer, the conditions I laid out in I think the first of our videos on this show. For A New Hope to make sense, the beginning of the entire franchise, for that to be left unmolested by this show, a number of things must be true. 1. Vader cannot spend any time in anything like close proximity to either Luke or Leia. 2. Luke can have no meaningful interaction with Obi-Wan. 3. Luke cannot see a lightsaber. If the leaks are to be believed, episode 6 will violate at least one of these conditions, but we are not going to prejudge that episode based solely on leaks, we will wait to pass judgement. As for our judgement on this episode however, and returning to the standard set out at the beginning, this was in places the best of the season so far. The writers put some thought into moments of character development and scene construction, and where they are undermined by problems, those problems were by and large born of earlier episodes and not this one. The drawing of parallels between the prequel era training sequence in Vader and Kenobi's present day actions is a relatively clever narrative device and proves that the writers are capable when they want to be of using nostalgia baits in a way that's actually relevant to the plot rather than as mere cynical deployment of member berries. Though the fact young Anakin ages about 15 years depending on which camera angle is being used, turning him from twink to haggard old man, is a bit distracting. Not to mention disappointing. But for all the episode does right, it does much more wrong. The same clumsy and lazy writing is present throughout, it's just that unlike previous episodes generally, and episode 4 in particular, it's punctuated by brief flashes of something vaguely resembling competence. At its best then, episode 5 is the best of the season, but at its worst, it is as bad at least as the rest. Some people are hostile to this kind of dissection, and some people have been made so desperate by the paucity of past offerings that they will mistake flashes of competence for a general improvement. Speaking for myself, and I'm sure for a good many fans, I don't think flashes of competence are good enough, and certainly not when the rest of the episode struggles to meet minimum acceptable standards. If it spends half its time in the nadir, and a tenth of its time somewhere above mediocre, the average is still piss poor. Its few objectively good moments are a hint of what could have been, and that only makes it more damning that these are the scant exceptions, and not the rule, or indeed, the bare minimum. On to episode 6, which I'm reasonably sure will be a complete fucking catastrophe, but, well, I guess we'll wait and see.